The great lands of the West were held in reverence by the Native Americans who dwelled here. Spectacular lands entrusted to their care by the Great Spirit. And so they cherished it, taking from it only what they needed, living in harmony with nature. They believed that this earth, the forests, the waters, the mountains, animals and the fields they grazed upon, even the heavens themselves were united together into a oneness with them. Sharing the same soul. Grand Lake is part of that heritage. It sits on the shore of a beautiful lake, surrounded by mountain peaks, a magnificent setting. The lake itself was formed during the last glacial period when ice gouged out a crater at the eastern end of the valley, just below the Continental Divide. Retreating glaciers piled moraines of stone and clay on the northern and western shores, all the way back to what is now the town of Grand Lake. The Kaufman House stands on one of these glacial ridges. Melting water filled the crater, creating the largest natural lake in Colorado, and its deepest, over 265 feet. Long before humans, there was the wildlife. The first people to settle in the region were the Ute and the Arapaho. The Arapaho came from their hunting grounds on the eastern plains, crossing over the towering mountains that divide the continent. They called the lake Spirit Lake because of a bizarre event that occurred during an especially hard winter. Thick ice had blanketed the lake, leaving only a tiny patch of open water at its center. From its depths, mist rose freezing in the frosty air, creeping across the snow. Slowly out of the watery abyss, an apparition rose silently into the thick vapor. The ghostly image of a great beast glowed through the mist. Then, as quickly as it had appeared, the apparition vanished, dissolving back into the freezing water, leaving only the swirling mist. Ever after, the waters where the great white buffalo dwelled were called Spirit Lake. The first white men entered the territory around 1867. The earliest permanent resident was Joseph Westcott. He built a small two-room cabin, complete with sawed roof, near the western shore on a stream created by water draining from the lake. This stream became known as the Outlet. Soon other settlers arrived, locating their cabins near Westcott on the Outlet. The real West wasn't anything like the West in Hollywood films. It wasn't romantic, not at all glamorous, and most of the time it wasn't very heroic.
Real life in the Old West meant a harsh, strenuous existence. The pioneers spent a lot of their time and most of their energy just providing themselves with the basic necessities of life. The cabins built by the early pioneers offered little more than crude protection against the elements. Cold poured in through cracks between the log walls. Conveniences we take for granted today, heat, electricity, running water, indoor plumbing, pastimes like television and music, even individual privacy didn't exist in the Old West. What little heat there was came from a fireplace or a small stove. Flickering candles and kerosene lamps offered only meager light, usually too dim to read or work by. Early settlers spent most of their time outdoors in the daylight, going into their cabins only to cook or to sleep. Westcott supported himself by hunting, fishing, and renting small boats to the few visitors venturing into the area. Eventually, he added more land to his homestead, subdivided it, and named it Grand Lake City. As more settlers moved into the territory, it became necessary to establish some kind of law and order. And so, Westcott was elected Justice of the Peace. Here is Judge Westcott, as he was called, with his good friend, John Mitchell. Mitchell was also one of the town's leading citizens. Anyone who played the fiddle for the Saturday night dances was someone to be reckoned with. Those dances represented a welcome high point in the settlers' lives. Everyone eagerly looked forward to Saturday night. As times grew better, crude huts were replaced by permanent homes. A few of these original structures still remain. In 1889, a cabinet maker, Warren Gregg, built a comfortable home for his family with his own hands. Because of the intricate trim he designed, people called it the Spider House. Winters in the mountains are harsh. Back then, winters were also dreary. Inside the homes, it was even gloomier, a cold, endless twilight. Isolated by deep snow with almost no activities to pass the time, the depression known as cabin fever took its toll. The Colorado River was called the Grand River until 1921, when its name was changed. For years, people thought Grand Lake was the source of the Colorado River. Later, it was determined that Grand Lake wasn't the headwaters at all. The Colorado River is born up there, at the top of the world. In 1847, the discovery of gold electrified the world, attracting people like moths lured to a flame. On the slim chance of striking it rich, hundreds of thousands of men from every part of the world poured into the West. Grand Lake proved no exception. In the 1880s, gold was found in the surrounding mountains. Prospectors raced into the territory. Before heading to the gold fields, they stopped in Grand Lake for supplies. The town's growing importance as a supply center for the gold rush led to its expansion. There was more money to be made equipping prospectors than from scratching in the dirt. And so in 1881, Grand Lake was surveyed and platted on the site where it is presently located. The flourishing town soon replaced Hot Sulphur Springs as the county seat, although the official books were never transferred to Grand Lake. Ezra Kaufman was a leading citizen in Grand Lake. 
Not only the town barber, he also guided hunting and fishing parties. After gold was discovered, he started guiding those struck by the fever. This group of prospectors, having just arrived from Fort Collins, was on its way to Lulu City. It wasn't long before mining camps sprang up around the most promising discoveries. Some were sizable communities. Teller City is a good example. Not only were there homes, the town also supported a large hotel, the Yates House, a newspaper, stables, several doctor's offices, and of course, saloons. Many saloons. Other settlements, however, were little more than camps with a sparse gathering of tents and rough huts separated by muddy paths. Near one of the more hopeful strikes, Benjamin Franklin Burnett founded Lulu City, naming it after his daughter. During its heyday, the population reached into the hundreds. Throughout the 50-year period of gold and silver discoveries in the West, only a handful of men became fabulously rich. One prospector, Isaac Alden, discovered a rich vein of ore, but before he could draw a map of his mine, fire destroyed the landmarks around his claim. Poor Isaac spent the rest of his life searching in vain, never again locating his mine. Almost a rich man, he ended his days supporting himself by cutting wood. Places like Lulu City drifted into memory. At the time this picture was taken in the 1920s, little remained of the once lively community. As the boom wound down, one discouraged Lulu City resident predicted that someday you'll see nothing but a footpath along this street. Here in this peaceful spot on the banks of the Colorado River was the home of hundreds of optimistic families who had come to the West searching for a better life. Most left with only empty dreams. On the 4th of July in 1883, a tragedy occurred that was to profoundly affect the entire territory for years to come. County Commissioner Edward Weber, along with the acting county clerk, Barney Day, and rancher Captain Dean, left their hotel on their way to a meeting. Crouched behind large rocks was Commissioner John Mills, who had been feuding with the group that was heading his way down the path. Accompanying him were two of his friends, Sheriff Royer and Under Sheriff Redmond. Well hidden, the two friends waited patiently with Mills, unaware of the real intention of their ambush. Mills had told Royer and Redmond that they were going to put a scare into the three men. Shooting erupted on both sides. When the smoke cleared, two commissioners lay dead. Captain Dean had been severely injured and succumbed to his wounds several days later. No one was ever brought to trial for the shootings. Although certainly a conspiracy, it's never been established how many people were involved. Although Hollywood westerns are full of shootings and gunfights, murder was considered a very serious crime in the Old West. Terrifying newspaper accounts of the incident scared tourists away for several seasons. This, combined with the murders, eliminated any opposition to moving the county seat back to Hot Sulphur Springs, where it remains to this day. Long before the Kawanichi Valley became part of Rocky Mountain National Park, private guest ranches lined the Colorado River. One of the most famous, was Squeaky Bob Wheeler's Hotel de Hardscrabble. Composed of a sod roof cabin, a small barn, and several tent houses, it offered modest accommodations. Squeaky Bob was a jolly, talkative, and genial host. Hotel de Hardscrabble welcomed many guests, some of them very distinguished. Despite the collapse of the gold rush, Grand Lake continued to prosper as a tourist area. 
That same year, Wilson Waldrum built his Grand Lake House. It was the largest frame building in town. Soon after Grand Lake was surveyed in 1881, James Cairns built a general store on this corner. In 1908, Cairns enlarged his general store. In addition to food and meat, he sold cloth, hardware, mining supplies, and other necessities of the Old West. Mr. Cairns had a garden, but he didn't sell the vegetables. Mr. Uh, Harbison did. And he sold quite a few because he had a big garden. And he raised uh, onions and carrots and, and radishes. And uh, the, the people that lived around the town on down to Granby and up into the park raised cattle. And they would kill one of them and then they'd cut it up and everybody'd have fresh meat. Well, uh, we played with Patience Carnes. Uh, her father didn't like children. He didn't want children, but he got one. And, what do you want to do and he didn't want her to have any company. He didn't want her to bring children there to play. So Patience came over here to play. She came here pretty near every day. And she played with us, and Mother treated her just like one of her own children. Mm -hmm. And uh, she, Patience never brought her dolls or her games, or, and she had a lot of things like that because they had more money and they bought them. But she never could share them with anybody because he didn't want her with any other children. Cairn sold his store to Matilda Humphrey in 1924. It forms the central part of the present Humphrey Building. We had the telephone for the whole town here as long as I can remember. We had a big telephone booth in that room, and Mother took, took the uh, telegrams. There was a man in Hot Sulphur Springs would call her, and she'd stand there and write the telegrams, you know, and they the, had... Uh, carbon copies and she would I would fi have filled them so she'd have a stack ready 